Many thanks to Wider and Rachel for this invitation to revisit a study, an update, a study that uh, we conducted originally in 2013 and that um, led uh, to a range of uh, publications and projects, uh, mainly focusing on the comparison of uh, Mozambique and Angola for uh, uh, several um, um, projects. One of them, uh, a collection on aid and authoritarian rule in Africa, uh, edited by Hagman and Reitens. Uh, my presentation today evaluates um, this research that we conducted, both in the light of uh, important and substantial uh, political developments in both countries, uh, now that uh, roughly uh, five years have elapsed, uh, but also and mainly uh, in the light of uh, developments in the literature, and specifically in one of the frameworks that we used in the original um, research uh, that has experienced uh, quite phenomenal expansion and development, and that is the political settlements uh, framework, uh, and specifically uh, Mushtaq Khan's uh, framework. And I'll explain uh, what that entails in a minute. Um, so um, in the light, as I said, of um, these uh, political changes and in the light of uh, this uh, development of the literature, um, the question arises of, uh, of, uh, about uh, the relevance of, of re-examining and rethinking whether this framework and these uh, new um, iterations of the framework have something to offer uh, to thinking or thinking about age and fragility. Um, so this is uh, an invitation and it's uh, more of a provocation um, than anything else. <clears throat> So to, to revisit a bit, and obviously in a very succinct matter, manner, because uh, we don't have a long time, um, kind of like the gist of our original arguments, um, uh, we uh, set out originally in 2013 to interrogate uh, dominant narratives about two countries that uh, had a lot in common and some stark differences, Angola and Mozambique and uh, to interrogate uh, what were prevailing narratives, and to a great extent, uh, narratives that uh, still prevail about Mozambique as a case in point of uh, a driven success story and Angola as emblematic of um, the resource course. Um, the starting point of um, the paper was exploring the effects that the availability of very different types of rents, uh, foreign aid in the case of Mozambique and uh, oil uh, resource, uh, revenue in the case of Angola had in the process of uh, institution building in these two countries that, as I said, had um, such stark uh, structural and historical commonalities. Um, our comparative exercise uh, we thought was uh, feasible uh, because while we had these commonalities, um, they were significant. There was also evidence showing that um, whereas uh, Angola's post-independence uh, state building uh, process had relied extensively on the, on, on the oil rent and that um, in, in a contrastive manner, the, uh, the contribution of, uh, of uh, aid or uh, development assistance had been uh, marginal in a very kind of like struck a striking contra contrast, Mozambique had received massive amounts of aid. It was considered uh, for a long period of time a very emblematic case of aid dependence. And uh, despite uh, more lately uh, developing some uh, capacity in destructive sectors, um, Mozambican elites, uh, or the Mozambican state rather, had largely failed to uh, effectively capture resources uh, from, uh, sorry, rents from resources. Uh, so in this um, sense, our paper first explored those uh, uh, implications of the very different material foundations of the political settlement in both countries, um, also charted the way in which, in which both states um, had structured um, its, their fiscal basis, and also attempted to explain um, the difference in the performance of both uh, states. Finally, uh, putting forward hypotheses about um, the conditions that led um, these countries uh, to diverge and the role that the presence or the absence of aid had had in that process. Among other um, ideas and concepts um, used at the time, uh, we also engaged with um, uh, the political settlement framework, 
Uh, and as I said, uh, this is uh, the political settlement framework as uh, developed originally by uh, Mushtakan, uh, which is different. And if I have time, I'll probably go into um, those differences because they're relevant to our discussion from other uses of the concept of political uh, framework. In a nutshell, uh, the idea of the political framework captures um, the fact that uh, uh, studying the uh, formulation and the implementation of institutions and policies can obviously not be done in isolation from understanding a specific uh, context in which uh, these uh, policies and institutions are attempted or introduced. Uh, but unlike other uh, traditions that also look at, uh, uh, at uh, power uh, constellations in the context where uh, policies are implemented, Kant's uh, framework focuses on how power is distributed among different organizations in society and how those distributional balances determine economic and political effects. Um, the idea being that um, um, institutions and policies are ultimately translated into decisions about resource allocation in society and result in the creation of rents. And these rents, taking us uh, streams of income or benefits uh, that are accrued from these political decisions are prone to, uh, are conflictive and create uh, tensions among groups in society. Um, because these groups are uh, affected differently by the creation of those uh, rents and uh, in relation to how much power they can wield, their capacity to either support or, um, uh, or resist uh, uh, transformation or new policies uh, is uh, sort of like uh, determined. Um, so ultimately, uh, the uh, political settlement framework studies the foundations and changes over time of the way that power is distributed among organizations uh, in society and how this results in uh, their uh, comp uh, relative ability to determine um, the effectiveness and outcomes of uh, institutions and policies. Obviously, uh, um, the political, uh, uh, the political uh, settlement framework uh, was not originally developed to account uh, for the impact and the effectiveness of, of aid. Um, and uh, in contrast, it's, uh, uh, been used uh, most uh, uh, traditionally to think about uh, processes of industrial strategies, uh, to think about uh, uh, structural transformation, and in later years it's been um, applied to the study of trade and uh, 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 service delivery and many other kind of like debates. And most strikingly, the framework has been uh, more widely utilized in the study of African development um, trajectories. And now there's a number of case studies on Angola, Ethiopia, Ghana, Mozambique, Rwanda, Tanzania, and Uganda um, that uses um, the framework. And so um, the, my, my interest today is to explore to what extent um, these new develop developments in the framework can be applied to thinking about uh, development assistance and the relation of uh, donors and uh, domestic economies. What's um, happened in, the, in this, um, in this uh, last uh, five years is that the um, framework has also become more conceptually coherent. Um, and um, therefore, uh, there's uh, room for asking these questions. At the center of um, the question is um, the observation that aid flows operate as a, as a form of uh, rent, and that uh, donors, donor strategies and conditions of disbursement can be conceptualized as institutional and policy initiatives. Um, the, key, the key insight of the political uh, settlement frameworks that has applications to thinking about aid is that uh, rather than studying the local power relations and the power balances simply as the context in which uh, aid policies and strategies are implemented, it is probably more helpful uh, to shift our focus to analyzing squarely uh, the interaction between aid programming and a more informed understanding of the history of the political economy of organizational uh, power distribution as proposed by Kahn in um, his framework. Um, secondly, um, that um, uh, uh, the framework could help understand how institutions uh, uh, will find their interests affected by different initiatives in terms of aid delivery and conditionalities, 
and how different organizations in societies might be able to mobilize uh, politically, either in support or against uh, aid uh, initiatives. Thirdly, um, it would be uh, extremely interesting to explore how aid is aligned with developmental prospects for a structural economic transformation. Uh, so breaking uh, free from a kind of like discrete study of aid effectiveness and a more uh, mainstream study of aid as one rent among many others having effects um, in society. Um, in fourth instance, it would be extremely interesting um, to um, ask how does, uh, do, does the delivery of aid-related uh, rents interact with other incentives in the actual making of uh, political settlements? Um, uh, and lastly, um, in a way, endogenizing uh, donors uh, less as uh, kind of like, um, external entities and more as parties uh, to the uh, creation and sustenance of um, the political settlements. Uh, so briefly, if uh, we move away from the idea of uh, power constellations and power relations as the context in which aid uh, strategies and aid programming is received and uh, move towards an understanding where we see aid effectiveness, effectiveness constructing and being an um, essential party uh, to the formation of political settlements, we are probably into a more interesting uh, uh, understanding of uh, the challenges experienced uh, by aid. I'm not sure I have um, time, I'll probably leave it for the uh, question and um, session um, to discuss um, these um, differences between um, Mushtakan's uh, approach to uh, political settlements and other alternative uh, neo-institutional economics or uh, conflict studies uh, uh, definitions of, and uses of the term. Uh, but what I think is distinctive about Mushtakan's uh, framework, and which probably is uh, uh, useful in, in these debates, is um, that in his um, use of uh, the political settlement um, concept, he is uh, recognizing um, that the conflicts created in the uh, uh, allocational decisions, uh, it, it is uh, rather more useful uh, to stop seeing them as a distortion or an aberration of fragile and violent uh, polities, but instead inherent uh, to development processes. Uh, this both in cases where uh, the rule of law administers such conflicts, and in cases where uh, violence um, kind of like uh, continues unchecked. Um, so to wrap up, um, if we think about um, kind of like the uh, core insights of this more coherent and developed uh, framework of political settlements uh, that has been kind of like coming out in publications in the last five years, um, there's a couple of insights that may be more provocative into problematizing uh, political settlements, uh, local power constellations, and aid. Um, as I said, and I think this is the main takeaway, is this uh, epistemolo epistemological shift away from um, thinking about power relations merely as the context uh, for the introduction of institutions and policies, and in our case, um, the rents uh, that uh, translate uh, aid programming and aid implementation, um, in, in, in the sense that uh, the political settlements uh, framework proposes to refocus uh, the study instead to the relative alignment or misalignment between, on the one hand, institutions that can be formal or informal, and, and, and as we know in the classical understanding of institutions as the rule of, rules of the game uh, that are present in the state, in the rule of law, in uh, constellations of governance, and uh, local uh, power balances, the capacity of organizations in societies and different uh, groupings, uh, societal groupings, to effectively uh, make claims on the state. And the idea here is that uh, clientelism and, and, and uh, uh, other forms of uh, patron-client relations uh, 
are ripe or exacerbated whenever patterns of organizational power distribution are uh, more uh, disaligned or misaligned uh, with institutional uh, settlement, institutional uh, uh, patterns. And um, this, uh, for important historical reasons uh, linked to colonialism, uh, linked to uh, the processes of late capitalist development, is more the case of in uh, former colonies uh, with less productive economies, as is the case of uh, some of these um, uh, countries that I mentioned um, in Africa. Um, there are uh, three ways in which uh, uh, political settlements framework uh, proposes um, to understand um, the channels uh, of, uh, uh, of and, and the dimensions of uh, political um, settlements. Um, the one is um, um, the vertical distribution of power that speaks about the relative uh, difference in uh, power between uh, the ruling coalition and uh, uh, the uh, excluded factions. And the gist of the argument here is that the uh, greater uh, the difference in, in power between the ruling co coalition and the, and the excluding, excluded factions, the larger um, the space, the, the wider the space that the uh, ruling coalitions has to the, uh, develop a more uh, uh, long-term horizon of uh, strategizing. Where, when competition is uh, tighter, uh, the ruling coalition has to uh, obviously spend more resources and more efforts uh, into just uh, remaining in uh, place. And this links to a core uh, concept within the framework, which is uh, uh, holding power, the ability of the ruling co coalition to remain in power. The second dimension um, that is, has been uh, proposed is uh, the horizontal distribution of power. And this, if I have a chance to elaborate uh, later on, it's quite key to what makes different or the, different, the difference between uh, Kant's uh, political settlement framework and other understandings of political uh, framework. Because whereas other understandings of political framework, for instance, um, emphasize elite bargaining, um, this horizontal uh, distribution of, of power uh, claims that uh, elites have are, um, and groups in power, coalition groups, uh, are uh, differentiated and heterogeneous internally, and that part of their power or this uh, horizontal dimension refers to their capacity to mobilize within their group uh, politically to resist effectively or to uh, support uh, any institutional uh, transformation, and in this case, uh, aid delivery or aid uh, programming. Um, so in this sense, um, Cam and others that have adopted uh, the framework reject the idea that uh, elite bargaining um, explains the totality of the uh, tension happening and uh, claims on the contrary that uh, uh, other than this um, um, uh, vertical distribution of power, there is this uh, horizontal uh, distribution within uh, the ruling coalition. The capacity of uh, uh, actors within the uh, ru ruling coalition to m politically mobilize um, uh, other parts of the coalition. So the higher echelons mobilizing their bases. Uh, which are not necessarily uh, contained within the elite. Um, and this obviously is a manifestation of uh, elite legitimacy or group legitimacy and creates uh, when, when, um, when the um, uh, higher echelons of uh, these organizations have a greater capacity to politically mobilize um, their bases. Um, they also have a greater space for coherence in action and effectiveness. So it's not purely that contestation between uh, ruling coalitions and groups in the opposition, but also the ability within ruling coalitions to act uh, coherently and effectively. And the third uh, dimension, and one dimension that was um, key to our uh, original study, is to do with the material foundations of the political settlement and the way in which uh, the settlement is maintained. Um, <clears throat> and so, finally, back to Angola and Mozambique. Uh, 
if we go back um, to uh, the commonalities of the two cases, we had two countries uh, where the liberation struggle and, and uh, independence led uh, to socialist powers uh, uh, getting in, into power and uh, a process that was followed in both cases by internal armed challenges. Uh, and in both um, cases, um, oppositional uh, factions received uh, uh, important external support uh, from international actors. Both countries experienced uh, long-lasting civil wars, ending in a transition uh, to multi-party democracy and market economy. And in both countries, incumbent parties have retained power and opposition uh, parties remain marginal. Uh, but here is where some important uh, differences uh, begin. And just as a note, um, obviously more recently, we've kind of like moved on from, 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 from where Mozambique and Angola were um, five years ago. And in, the, in these five years, we've had, in both cases, important corruption scandals, and in both cases, a relatively peaceful um, uh, power transition within the ruling party. But in the case of Mozambique, a stronger uh, internal opposition growing and expressed uh, now in a uh, form of armed unrest um, and um, a very transformed uh, relationship with donors. And uh, to zero in on the differences, um, well, when the war ended early on in Mozambique in the early 90s. Um, it ended with a negotiated agreement that mediated, that was mediated by third party countries. And it sort of like brought together uh, Mozambique and a number of donors uh, and the uh, kind of relationship became quite uh, strong. And uh, when uh, fiscal effort was necessary uh, to fund the political reconstruction uh, in the post-conflict period, donors were very forthcoming and, and did support uh, the reconstruction of the state. Uh, very differently in Angola, um, the war did not end with a negotiated agreement. It dragged on uh, for a far, uh, decade more. And um, uh, the war was funded by a resource that Mozambique uh, did not have and Angola did, which was uh, kind of like oil and, and, and to a great extent also diamonds, um, which meant um, that by the time Angola, uh, kind of like uh, 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 the war came to an end in Angola, uh, Angola had not developed this uh, dependence on aid and um, retained largely a relative autonomy uh, because it could fund uh, part of the reconstruction process from the revenues of its uh, resource uh, uh, extraction. And uh, here we formulated at the time a couple of hypotheses uh, that would uh, be interested to revisit and to um, assess uh, the extent to which uh, they uh, succeeded in explaining uh, the contrast between two countries. We found that uh, indeed the different uh, sources of rents in the two countries uh, led to different outcomes. Um, that the different sources of the rent, rents in one case aid and in the other um, natural resources uh, created very dif different uh, fiscal structures during the post-war reconstruction period and were very central uh, to differences in the state building process. Um, but these structures were not merely different because they are based on uh, different rents, uh, but in, uh, rather respond to the effect that um, uh, uh, the different types of revenue, and very importantly, the timing of their use in the consolidation of the political settlement in each country was made effective. So for instance, whereas in Angola, uh, the contemporary uh, process, uh, contemporary to the process of contestation during the war, um, there was the availability of this uh, rent, and this resulted in the consolidation through the rent of a very strong ruling coalition. In Mozambique, after uh, the resources were only made available after the violent consultation was over, and resulted in elites that sort of like cohesed and formed before uh, the kind of like uh, resources uh, were uh, forthcoming. In Angola, we find a case of a more unified uh, command with a capacity uh, to prospect and to, uh, and with the, the fiscal imperative um, to use uh, resources 
A, to uh, uh, propped up uh, the ruling coalition, but also uh, to combine with and in combination with some despotic rule, also to uh, create some legitimacy through a, a, a modicum of, uh, uh, of public service provision. Uh, what is remarkable about Angola is that in the process, uh, the country did craft a highly performing national oil company and uh, secured to a great extent the appropriation, not necessarily with progressive outcomes, but the appropriation by the state of the oil rent. Um, of course, the Angolan regime had an incentive to ensure that the, poly the oil sector performed because it was the basis of its functioning, uh, not only of the state, but of the party and of its very, very centralized um, uh, ruling coalition. Um, the uh, ruling party needed the oil rent as much as the oil rent, in this case, the oil company, uh, required a coherent ruling coalition. On the contrary, uh, Mozambique relied uh, on aid in the process of uh, state building and post-conflict reconstruction. Um, from the beginning, aid in Mozambique was uh, governance rather than growth driven. And uh, uh, importantly, um, was uh, focused on strengthening the opposition and on um, uh, strengthening the electoral uh, process, both uh, 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 processes that had uh, very uneven outcomes. And um, this led to a ruling stage that is uh, comparatively uh, less autonomous. And um, the management of rents is a bit of opposite to what we found in Angola, with um, emerging interest groups and private accumulators very much linked to the ruling party, um, being considerably autonomous and uh, kind of like not, not, not necessarily uh, ruled by the top by a very, very centralized uh, opposition. Uh, so I think that with this, I um, will close and um, yeah, we'll uh, continue discussing um, the, ca the case in the Q&A session. Thank you.